Hello everyone, DSO here from DadStartingOver.com, and before we get started with today's episode, I wanted to tell you about the DSO Fraternity. The DSO Fraternity is the members-only portion of my website at DadStartingOver.com, and you can learn more about it at DadStartingOver.com slash join for $14.99 per month or $149 for the entire year. You get access to all three of my books at no additional charge. You can download a PDF directly to your computer, or you can stream the audio of the book live on your computer or phone, or you can download the MP3 file. You also get access to private discussion groups on Facebook, and you also get to attend live member meetings on Zoom. We have approximately three meetings every single week on a variety of different topics. We have members from all over the world who attend. Don't forget we also have member-only articles along with member-only audio for you to enjoy. And lastly, If you were looking at one-on-one coaching with myself or one of our other three coaches and were scared off by the pricing, pricing for DSO fraternity members is considerably less. So again, give it a shot. Check it out at dadstartingover.com slash join. And now on to today's episode. So Austin and Shannon, my very first couple interview here on the podcast. Thank you guys so much for doing this. This is awesome. I greatly appreciate it. And we were t- chatted a little bit before this that we're going to let Shannon um, drive the car a little bit more, so to speak. Austin, you have done an episode previously, so we should know everyone, if you haven't already, go back in the previous episodes of this podcast and search for, some, for an episode with Austin in it. And that is, in fact, this Austin that we're talking to today, and you can hear his story. Well, we're going to hear the other side of the story. We're going to hear from Shannon and her experience in uh, being the wife of Austin, specifically over this past year. Has it been about a year, Austin? It has been 11 months. Yeah, so about a year. But in, in case yeah, for, right those, for those listening wondering what the hell we're talking about, it's been about a year, 11 months since he discovered and read my book. And not to give my, you know, inflate my ego too much, but this was a big aha moment for Austin. And he really ran with it and said, This is the beginning of something. I'm going for it. I'm making some major changes. Damn it. And he smacked himself upside the face. And he's made a lot of improvements. And that's why we're here today. And um, he's been very active on the Facebook discussion groups. He's a member of the DSO fraternity. He's active on the meetings. He's just been, you've also written for the group. So that's been wonderful. So just an excellent contributor to the group. Can't think of a better person to talk to about this with his wife, Shannon. So Shannon, if I may begin Mm -hmm. asking you some questions again, thank you for doing this. Uh, How did, uh, how did you meet Austin and what the heck was it about him that made you say he's the one? Gosh, uh, that is a long and sort of kind of boring story, but I'll give a nutshell version of it. Um, So I just, um, I worked my ass off for this. um, I'll just let them remain nameless, the corporate tanning salon company um, in in my home state of North Carolina. And I worked my ass off and, you know, started out as a, just a normal person working there. And I saw a lucrative opportunity within that company to move up. And I was really good at it. So I worked really hard, got a promotion to an assistant manager. You know, they said there's a conference for management of store and assistant management and district managers in Columbia, South Carolina. We don't really have the money for you to go at the moment because we didn't plan for a new promotion, but we're going to send you anyway because you need it. So that meeting was at the Marriott in Columbia, South Carolina whom Austin had just started a job there three days prior to me going. So it was just kind of all written in the stars, I feel like, of my last minute okay to go, him starting that job three days prior to, and um, the girl that I went there with, uh, we drove up to the little semicircle thing where you pull up and a bellman comes and I loaned your car for you while well, that bellman was Austin. <laughs> and then <laughs> I, I tried talking to him 
multiple times in the elevator. Again, you know, it's his third day there. He was pretty much ignoring me in the elevator. And I was like, why the hell is this guy not talking to me? Like, this is smooth, smooth. bizarre. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, he finally talked to me. I finally got a little bit of information out of him. Like, I asked him about his haircut because it was very obviously, um, like, military style haircut. So I asked what branch he was in, and I did not know anybody in the Marine Corps. And that, what he told me he was in was the um, the ROTC Marine Corps. Like, um, well, technically it's the Navy, and you can choose Navy or Marine Corps. But he was going to stick with Marine Corps at his um, ROTC, and that, and he kind of sort of told me later on why he got a job as a bellman um, and why he was not in Virginia at the moment. So, and then we, what, then what did he do? I sent him on an errand to get a jacket out of my friend's car. And I, I was naive and young and said, Oh, it's my jacket. I forgot my jacket. It has like a lot of cash in it. Please go get that. Whatever. <laughs> I missed and, the moment. Um, what was that, Austin? I jokingly said foreshadowing for the rest of my life. Foreshadowing, <laughs> sending you on on uh, on little gopher trips. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my little pachyderm. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, and um, so, I mean, let me stop you there. So, obviously, he passed the looks test enough enough for you to say, "Well, hello, who are you? Let me talk to you and get to know you." Um, of course. Yes, so, absolutely. So, okay. Very good. So we have that out of the way that Austin is not a troglodyte. He actually has some good looks about him. And, uh-huh. and he said, uh, all right, I like this guy. And then there was the added benefit of the bad boy military dude. The alpha male yeah. uh, attraction there. Cause he can't exactly be a, a wuss and be in the military. Like it is typically it's, literally a fraternity or a brotherhood, I guess, if you will, of all dominant type A personalities. And Absolutely. Prior to Austin, I assume there were guys before him. Were, mm-hmm. were those guys of the same mold? Do you typically like the guys who, you know, athletes, military, those types? Yes, I would definitely say I uh, have a, a physique type and and personality type for sure okay very good tough manly types and at that time yeah at the time he he checked the boxes okay so you're sending him on his first errand to get the <laughs> the jacket and the money out of the car he dutifully obeys and then what happens yes and he just stood there and looked at me as if he were waiting on a tip and I told him <laughs> that jacket had cash in it and I don't tip him. And I give him my phone number instead. Very nice. I like it. <laughs> I like it. And so how long was the courtship process? If you want to call it that, how long did you guys date before getting hitched? Um, <laughs> not long at all. About three months. No way. Seriously. Wow. Mm-hmm. What was the rush? 10 because- years later. Because he was going to be deployed or what, was there a rush for a reason or it was just, you just knew? Um, it was kind of, it, I don't, I wouldn't really say both, but kind of, but not for the reason that people typically rush something like that for their significant other going away. It was just that 90% of it was because both of us 100% sure knew that, you know, we were that's it. You know, like we're the two penguins and we give each other their pebbles and we're soulmates for life. But the other 10% was I went, you know, like I knew that when he left for Virginia, that did mean that he was going to get his first duty station. And if we were not married, I couldn't go. So. And you don't want to let him go. You don't want to risk losing him. No. Not this and Jim. <laughs> so let's jump ahead to you've already had children. How many children? Just one. Just the one kid. You've been married. Mm-hmm, just for, our three year old son. Yep. And so 11 months ago, when 
Austin found my book. Let's just round it and say a year ago. You had been together at, mm-hmm. at that you had been together at that point for nine years, correct? That's right. And had a kid. So at what point in that mm-hmm. uh, in that nine year period with your child? At one point in that nine-year period, can you, looking back with 2020 vision, can you say the wheels started falling off a little bit? We started going off the rails, and the Austin that you met kind of started molding or shaping himself into something else. When did that start happening? Hmm. Um, I can confidently say that stuff started falling off the rails probably at the end of uh, 2017. Like when we had to live with his parents for six months while we found a house where in the town that we live in. Staying with parents. That was an, yeah, that's, that's, a pretty yeah. Stress, that's a pretty stressful thing. You are not breaking mine. <laughs> I mean, there's the, you know, just living with anyone else, but living with your yeah. husband's parents. <laughs> Um, well, what was it that was so stressful and frankly, such a turnoff? Well, you know, it's, it's, this statement goes, if it were my parents, like, you know, it, it's just your, your parents, your in-laws. And, you know, we had a still relative, we were first time parent. We are at that. We were, sorry, we were first time parents at that moment in time. And our son was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about a month old. Or t- um, so there, there is a lot of stressors, you know. Um, yeah. His his parents have a different uh, style of parenting, which is fine. Everybody has that. That's totally fine. But you know, when you're a first time parent, you want to navigate <laughs> that yourself, and yeah, and not yeah. have other things pushed on to you or become like it honestly made me extremely overbearing and I got super paranoid for a while about mm-hmm. not ever letting our son down because I had to be the one like holding him, mm-hmm. feeding him, doing X, Y, or Z for him and not Austin's mom. And then, you know, that created tensions between me and his parents because they're loud as fuck sometimes in their house like my goodness but it's their house but you know we also we had a fairly still newborn phase child and he did wake up very easily for a while Mm -hmm. like so you know then it kind of made me a tyrant a little bit and not my house controlling noise levels and just wanting to do everything my way because you know that's my child I'm this is the first time I'm a mom and it took us so freaking long to get pregnant and I you know made me a little resentful towards his parents a little bit sure so sure. that, uh, that was, was just a very interesting dynamic something I hear a lot from women is the watching the interaction between their husband and his parents And uh, I'm not saying this is what Austin did, but this is pretty common is um, the husband doesn't stand up for the wife and the kid. You know, the wife wants to feel like this is, you know, this is team Austin and Shannon and to heck with your parents and everybody else. Are you on my side or not, Austin? Was he on your side in a lot of those, that tension that you had with mom and dad there? Yes, but I uh, did for... (sighs) Not force, I, I guess, it in turn forced him to become a middleman between me and his parents because I had an issue of, when I say issue, like I was unable to mm-hmm. uh, confidently talk to his parents about what was troubling me about their actions or what they were or weren't doing, only because this truly was the first time of me having a very personal, intimate relationship with his parents. Like, because the majority of our marriage, we did not live in his home state. So, you know, we would come and visit his parents and they would come visit us for, you know, four or five days at a time or 10 days, you know, when we 
lived overseas for a bit. And, you know, like it was never, I never got to know them. You know, Austin's known them his whole life. Oh, yes. So, so wow. This I, is, I, I mean, felt it worked. You were thrusted into brand new kid, all the stressors and everything else involved with that. Here, let me throw you into somebody else's home. Hey, it's your in-laws, your in-laws that you really don't know all that well, at least not, not, mm -hmm. not compared to what you're about to learn over the next few months. And the, mm -hmm. the, the stressors of, I would assume, mother-in-law being the ones like, no, no, that's not what you do. The kid, let me, let me show you how and everything else. And you're just like, ah, get out of my hair and leave me alone. And Austin, tell your mother not to do this. Tell your dad not to say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. this little personal anecdote. With my first marriage, my mom decided when our daughter was born, first born, first child, that she was going to stay the night for a few nights to help out. Because obviously, my wife at the time needed the help. This was just not even a question. Mm -hmm. And here she was coming with a bag saying, I'm here to help out however you need me. And by like day two, I remember my wife calling to me and I went in and she was just bawling her eyes out, holding a child saying, your mom needs to leave. She has to leave now. <laughs> this is not <laughs> happening. This is not <laughs> happening. And here was me with, you know, my shoulders slumped going in the room going, mom, um, <clears throat> you, you got to go. She's like, why? What happened? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but she's crying and she wants to be alone with the baby. It's too much. You need to leave. And my dad came, picked her up. That was kind of a traumatic scene, but so totally relate oh, to that. I can only imagine. Oh yes. So, but I mean, that's, um, pretty common scenario and it wasn't forever. It was just for a matter of months. And so you leave, but you, you point out specifically this as kind of a turning point for you. Was it because of the way you didn't recover from it too well? Was your image of Austin kind of, oh, what's the word lessened during this? Did you see a side of him you didn't like so much or what was it that caused that to be such a instrumental turning point in the relationship? Um, I, I, bet I, my opinion or my image of Austin was definitely not lessened. If anything, he in turn helped me through that weird phase of our lives of, of, you know, I have, I have, you know, I guess you could really say like intimate intimacy issues in the facet of I have a difficult time connecting with um, parental figures. I, I don't have a super great relationship with my mom. However, you know, it has gotten better because I've chosen to make that better. Like I, I've just had to put my differences aside and be the adult. So I had issues, you know, um, being able to really, talk to someone other than my husband of telling them how I feel and like, no, this is not okay. This is my boundary. Please don't cross that line. Like I'm uncomfortable. So it wasn't that with, with his living with his parents. It honestly was, we didn't really, um, this sounds so benign and so like such a small little snowball of what I'm about to say. We didn't really have too much of a say of how we ate at his parents' house. So we both put on weight and I mean, kind of like viewed it as like a, like a six month long vacation. Like we just had cheese and wine and just kind of ate whatever the hell she made. Mm -hmm. And it's not our style of, and don't get me wrong. His parents have actually changed the way they eat a lot drastically um, now, but then it was not how we eat now. And, you know, I put on weight, Austin put on weight, and then neither one of us kind of gave a shit about the weight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a while until we both realized, well, shit, we're fat. So, I mean, if there's, if there's a period in time where you want to take control and have things done your way in a very specific way, and you want to be healthy and just overall uh, control over the entire environment from A to Z. It's when you have a kid, especially your very first kid. Mm -hmm. You're very particular about oh, this. Yeah. This is the way I want this. And this is when we're going to go to bed. And this is what we're going to eat. And all that just went right out the window when you live under mom and dad's roof. So I can just see that just mm -hmm. being a, just an all around hugely stressful thing. 
okay so here here you are in the in the timeline we're at now it's you got your own place you you're back to eating normal foods as, as far as what you consider normal so at at mm-hmm. this at this point in the relationship how would you rate just your closeness and intimacy between the two of you um the closeness it did get better um we still uh I don't really remember a whole lot because, gosh, I mean, you know, our son started teething and then like had trouble sleeping. I don't know. Like, I just, I don't truthfully remember. Um, you, were on auto, you were on autopilot. It's just a blur at that point. Yeah. Truthfully, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know that I, like, I'm not stupid. I knew, I knew and knew now that there were intimacy issues between Austin and I, like husband and wife domain but i don't really know when that truthfully started you can't pinpoint it to an exact moment Uh, there was the stressor which kind of living with mom and dad and everything that went with it and you kind of came out of that but then you know that begs the question if there was no mom or dad place you still have a new kid that's a whole new stressor in itself and that's Mm -hmm. uh, you know i've as you may or may not know, I've talked to a lot of guys and I asked the same question. When did things start going off the rails? And probably nine times out of 10, I'll hear as soon as we had our kid, um, the wife completely changed. Oh, I'm sure the, the husband Everything. can tell you the minute and the hour that oh, oh, exactly. <laughs> it happened. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, uh, I lost my job. We had a kid, that kind of stuff. So Austin, if you're there, uh, uh, how would you, okay. So it's post living with mom and dad. The kid at this point is what, like a six, seven month old at this point? Um, Not, he was nine months old when we moved in this house. Nine months old when you moved in. So at that point, Austin, what is the state of Austin and of the relationship at this point? I would say from what I can remember, it probably went back to the way that it was before we moved in with my parents, um, which to take it back a little bit, I, I was surprised to hear her say it went off the rails in 2017 because I think in, um, in, but when I first answered that question with you, it was more like 2014 around the time I got out of the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I got to be a little bit more of an, an inside dweller as, as she would say, hissing at the sun. When I go outside, (laughs) got got my, my uh, IT job and, and uh, or consulting and um, just became a little bit more of a desk sitter. Um, anyways, that as far as our intimacy, I would say that's probably where it slowed down in my mind first. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, when, when definitely when we moved in with my parents, that was a, a big um, stressor for sure. Yeah. I was going to say a stressful time. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I think it went back to about the way that it was before we moved in with my parents after that, um, which is not it's still not great. Yeah. No, still at that point. Great. So on, on a scale of one to 10, you were down to a five, you move in with mom and dad, it's down to a two, then you're back up to a five again. So it's not wonderful, not necessarily a passing grade, but it, it'll do. And obviously not bad enough where Shannon goes, oh man, <laughs> It was bad in 2013. She, they didn't even come up. And Shannon, in hearing Austin say that, does it surprise you to hear him say that? So does it surprise does it surprise you to hear him say that he was this, you know, inside dweller blah of a man in 2013? And in his mind, that's when the intimacy started breaking down. But no, he he's right in that. That's when you know stressors of. Um, we'll say real life happened of, um, you know, like, well, shit, we're out of the Marine Corps. So now what, you know, we have to find a home. We have to get a VA loan approved. We have to decide something so permanent of, um, picking out a good house or building a good house, getting a good job, moving to a state and city that we don't know anybody literally starting from, scratch from zero. So, you know, the first year of our lives back in Texas or, you know, back in the States, 
and in Texas specifically, where that first year is extremely freaking hard, you know, of building a house and me working full time and, you know, of course, Austin working full time. And, um, I, you know, I, I monitored the building and supervised the building of our first home, like this enormous, <clears throat> excuse me, this enormous purchase that we were making for the first time together, like in our lives and our marriage. And I was essentially working two jobs, even though I wasn't getting paid for being like the site manager of our house. And I was tired a lot. I worked retail. I was on my feet eight, nine, 10 hours a day in heels, doing makeup, hearing women bitch about stuff. And like, it was, it was a lot, man. Like it was. Mm -hmm. And then that is when, you know, Austin, the, I have listened to some of your book, like a couple chapters. So um, that's when the creepiness about sex started Mm. and the, the negotiations of when we were supposed to be intimate, how long, like how, like this, how long the span was in between each time and and, you know that that's just that's just a a turn off and Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the i will never we we and i will never forget this one agreement we had is the (laughs) stupidest fucking thing in the world i thought i still love these things they are hiding in a closet upstairs that he thinks they're hideous i bought these oversized galvanized steel fork and spoon like a shabby chic like farmhouse decor before that was like actually a thing like it is now of like the farmhouse crap and (laughs) i wanted them up on the wall in our kitchen on either side of our pantry door and i will never forget it you know we're unpacking our stuff in our house and he's like you can have those up on the wall if we have sex every two or three days and like it was an agreement like i had to shake his hand on that. It was so stupid and creepy. <laughs> so creepy. What is the line between a guy that's just being flirtatious, sexy, fun, and creepy for you? Ha- making an, like making your wife make an agreement. That's about pretty, when, that's pretty creepy. When, yeah. <laughs> Of like when sex has to be because you want this fork and spoon on the wall. Wow. So when it has to be, you know, often hear from women that um, a a lot of men get to the point when there's so little intimacy, but we men just have this carnal need for it. Just like, you know, food and water, just like a guy crawling through the desert. We'll, you know, we'll start bargaining for it. If it means, you know, getting the water that we need and a lot of the time we skip, you know, we go right to step Z, which is the sex. We skip all the A through Y and the A through Y is kind of the making that connection, being sweet, being flirtatious, just togetherness, connection, intimacy. There's the end result is the sex at the end of the day, end of the week, whatever it may be. Was there any attempt at on his part I guess to ask either of you, Austin, did you feel there was an attempt on your part to make that connection or were you so bogged down in work and kids life and everything else that there really wasn't time for that connection and darn it, you still have your needs? No, I, I, I think we would probably agree on the fact that on a relationship level, not including intimacy, we didn't really suffer there. Mm-hmm. You felt connected, both of you. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So what was the switch flip, Austin, from a guy who's connected and it just naturally, you're just naturally intimate together, flirtatious, sexy, whatever. Where did the switch flip from that to guy who suddenly becomes very creepy and is trying to negotiate intimacy? I, I would say complacency, where... I got lazy. Mm -hmm. I wasn't working on myself. I let myself go physically and probably um, energy wise around the house. I would say mentally a little bit like you're 
I, I would say mentally a little bit too for him, like um, be, mentally meaning that um, he he uh, he wasn't working on himself, like g- going into that category of, you know, he's always watching YouTube stuff and um, it, just always constantly learning. Like he always has been that way. That's his personality type, but mm-hmm. it, it dwindled a tad. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say that when, when I got complacent and lazy and then things started to go south, that's when kind of what you're talking about wandering the desert needing water it, it, it's kind of you, you start to get desperate yeah. and you try to claw it back any way possible and you do creepy things <laughs> shannon is it simple enough as saying he very much kind of dwindled dwindled himself down into a relatively unattractive version of him and you just weren't turned on by the the package that you had in front of you yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. And it's not necessarily solely physical, although I'm sure that was a component of it, but it's just his his oomph, his joie de vivre, as we call it, his, his joy of life, his energy, his ambition, and everything just was turned way down. And the initial, the first Austin that you met back at that hotel back then, this isn't that guy anymore. Right. This is a whole new version. And this, this, the, I use the term package. Maybe that's the wrong term to use. <laughs> <laughs> the package put in front of you, the, the, uh, uh, the, this new Austin 2.0 is just, yeah, this just ain't cutting it. And, um, those butterflies are long gone. They don't come out for this guy. They come out for the other guy, but not for this one. But was, was that ever, and this is something that a lot of guys say because we're such blunt, overt creatures, us guys. Mm -hmm. which is evident by him trying to bargain for sex and other things is that a lot of the time we will say, uh, why the hell did my wife just tell me fill in the blank? So, well, I mean, quite frankly, like, could you really look at your wife and say, Hey, I love you, but you have gotten fat as hell. Like, and, and like, look her dead square in the eyes. And you're talking to the wrong guy here because yeah, I probably would. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, and that's actually something that I train a lot of guys in and in not so many words, but um, I, you, there's nothing wrong with sitting your partner down and saying, I love you to pieces and I'm here to help you however I can. But this, you know, fill in the blank that you're doing, it could be you're working a hundred hours a week and they could be, you've let yourself go physically. It could be you're depressed or whatever it may be. What I'm seeing here it's slowly but surely dwindling away at my attraction to you. And I don't like it. This isn't the person I married. I, I wish more people had that talk. And I think a lot of guys would say, yeah, damn it. Why didn't she have that talk with me? That would have woke me up. Well, and you know, I attribute that to um, a guy has an, has no problem. Like two guys have no problem saying, having that conversation about their spouses mm-hmm. to each other. The issue I think with that is of, I don't necessarily think it's the female's fault for not coming to the male, but also the male's fault because for some reason he has now put his wife and family up on a pedestal. Mm -hmm, That's, mm -hmm. that's not bad, but it, it can be a good thing in a healthy way to have your fam, your family and your wife up on a pedestal. But when it, comes in between you not being able to approach your wife and, and really look at her and have a real conversation, like two adults, like two real people, then that's a problem. Mm-hmm. I agree hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. goes both ways. In fact, from what I've seen, interestingly, it's the women that come to those, Hey, we need to have a sit down talk because this is no good anymore they're more apt to do that versus the guy. And I think a lot of us guys have been beaten into our head that if we even approach anything like that talk, no matter how nice and how much we can massage it to where it doesn't sound so confrontational, how, whatever form we put it in, we're told that that makes us a really bad guy to even go there. It's like, you know, a woman can just, you know, well up some tears and say, are you telling me just because I gained 50 pounds 
from having our baby that you don't love me anymore. You don't want me anymore. You know, how shallow are you to have these thoughts? And um, they're perfectly legitimate thoughts as much as it is a woman saying to her husband, ever since you lost your job, I have lost respect for you and your ambition and stuff is gone. So I agree. If we both, both men and women would just set aside our feelings of, well, if I say this, it'll hurt his feelings. If I say this, it'll hurt her feelings. If we just set that aside and go for it, because invariably what happens is you end up in a um, marriage counseling session. And one of you says, why the hell didn't you just tell me that? (laughs) If that's how you felt all those years. So anyway, but, but hindsight's 2020 and there you are. And your attraction to him is slowly, but surely dwindling. And it's showing up in the form of intimacy is going down, which Austin is completely aware of, but this begs the question, are you aware of it at the time? Yeah, but I honestly was too tired from Mm -hmm. working. Um, I, I knew that something had changed. It's just, when was I supposed to have time in my mind to fix it? Because, you know, also at that point, even though Austin was at home working all day, I still came home and worked at home. Like I would go get groceries. I would clean. Granted, I suck at folding laundry. Like I'm a pro at washing and drying stuff, but I hate folding. And, you know, I, I would do all this stuff still when I've gotten home from working and standing in heels on my feet on marble floors all day. And I'm like, well, well, what the hell? What, you know, you're sitting at your desk inside of our beautiful home, you know, in a cushy little chair. And like, I still have to come home and clean. So Mm -hmm. why am I going to be in a mood Mm -hmm. to be intimate with you? Like after being tired and emotionally spent from other people needing me at work, you know, Mm -hmm. like that. You're coming home to another child, in other words. It's in some aspects, yeah, essentially. Yeah. Sounds familiar. Sounds a lot like right from the book. And so let's fast forward to Austin. You find the book. You read it. Light bulb moment. Well, holy shit, this makes sense. And what is your first step towards the new you? Austin 3.0, we'll call it. Well, yeah, like like I... Uh, told you a long time ago, feels like at this point, um, it was very similar to a lot of the guys. It was just textbook. You know, the, the book was me exactly. Um, so I had very much the, the entire uh, change approach. Um, I was doing it, literally everything wrong, as the book points out. So I changed literally everything it recommended um, overnight which probably the biggest change was my physical activity overnight, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I started working out every day, even at that time, because it was right at the beginning of COVID lockdown. So I started, um, you know, just doing push-ups and sit-ups and uh, Mm. whatever else I could do. I mean, when I tell you I've, I've never really worked out other than just kind of Marine Corps PT, I mean, I didn't even have anything to do pushups with other than my hands. Like I, yeah. I didn't have any workout equipment <laughs> at all. Okay. And so about time to try to acquire that. So you were pretty like sedentary. You were pretty sedentary. And this is a huge change all of a sudden to you say every single day you're doing some kind of physical exercise at home. Oh yeah. And, and even, to this day, I've probably been sore since March last year. <laughs> okay, but point is, Shannon, here you are. Here's this guy that sits at a desk all day, and he's turning into a potato. And then one day you come home, and he's banging out 20 push-ups. And then he's doing some burpees. And then he's doing some sit-ups. Are you, at this point, a little concerned, wondering what the hell's going on? Or are you elated and saying, yes, my my husband's back? No, I I would I would never be concerned about Austin, like I 100% trust him. And like, I would never think like, well, that's suspicious, you know, like Mm -hmm. he's working out, like, first of all, that's kind of an asshole or a dick move on my part to like wonder (laughs) why is he working out? Why is he eating Mm -hmm. better? Like, why is he, 
good. You're changing something about yourself that you saw that you needed to change. That's awesome. Like, what can I do to help? Like, how can I change our, our, um, grocery pickup list order thing? Like, how can, what can I stop cooking? That's not healthy. You know, like I, awesome. I'm not, I'm you. not that type of person that, yeah. because then that's, that's also something wrong within the, 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 the spouse, the wife, that's like, Hmm, I'm going to start snooping around because I don't, I don't trust his new bizarre behavior mm-hmm. like that. That's just, that's not healthy either. <laughs> no, but it's very, very common. And I have learned this from many discussions that Austin and I oh, have yeah. we, talked we, just about stuff. Yeah. Austin, we've heard that more often than not where a man will say, so I joined the gym. And the second day I went to the gym, the wife's like, why are you going? What's going on? Are you cheating on me? (laughs) And the man's like, no, I'm just trying to get my butt in shape. So very, very, very common. And, you know, of course, it's very unhealthy. Uh, You would would think a healthy spouse would be like, hot damn. Yes, this is awesome. You you did how many push-ups? Can I go to the gym with you? Uh, you Whatever it may be, you know, to see your person improve in some way. I agree 100%. That's a positive and i wish more women had uh, your frame of mind in that so that's great so here he is physically doing things and but austin did you in a roundabout way kind of announce like man i'm just not happy with the way i look that's why i'm doing this or you just let your actions talk and it was never really spoken no i so two things there is i don't even think i noticed um any indication that she noticed any changes in me at all the first month. Um, but then in addition to that, um, you know, I knew the moment I read that book, I knew I had a lot of work to do. So I didn't say anything to her about anything. I, I might've even done the push-ups and sit-ups and not, not secret, but just in my office the first well, good for you. Good, good. Week. Yeah. Um, because as you know, there's, there's a tipping point in this kind of self-improvement stuff, which is it goes from, man, I genuinely just want to lose 20 pounds, put on some muscle. Great. Versus boy, I hope my wife notices. Let me, let me start doing some push-ups in the living room and see if she says anything. In other words, I hope mommy, you know, pats me on the head and, and tells me I'm a, being a good boy, which is just, just as unattractive as if he's doing nothing. Right. Yeah. So and, good. and given given my my nature of I mean she'll tell you my, my nature of you know trying something testing it in a controlled environment I'm a little weird about that kind of stuff but uh, you know I wanted you know as most people know uh, she's known about the group and the book probably since the third or fourth month right third month and um, but prior to then. Prior to then, I didn't want her to know at all because I really wanted to try it in a controlled mm-hmm. environment. I wanted to make the changes specifically um, as they were called out in the book and, and you know, try um, to, to see, trying to think of the word. Your audience. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was testing, you know, specifically in a controlled environment with, without her knowing Mm-hmm. Almost like a, a blind study. Blind, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. just, you know, is it going to work um, without her having any knowledge of what I'm doing? If I just change these things, what are the results? Okay, so begs the question then. You said you did that for a period of a few months? Yeah, it was, it was a few months before. I mean, I, I made sure that we had significant changes in our relationship before, you know, I, I was willing to to let her see me interacting on the group or um good good so no i was doing something pointed yeah now we're getting into some really interesting stuff so three months into this shannon your perspective what are you seeing uh about his changes everything like are you noticing a new him mentally physically oh i mean yeah absolutely like i would have to be blind (laughs) to not notice that there's a a visible physical change in him and in, in a positive way. I would assume oh, his, yeah. oh, his, yeah. his manly quotient went up a few points. Yeah. <laughs> He's starting to fill out a shirt, but in a good way. Mm-hmm. 
and you've already commented that you're one that doesn't shy away from saying, I like manly men. So this is a good thing. And then I'll flip it back to you, Austin. She's noticing, but what, uh, get as personal as you want, but what, uh, what were the fruits of your labor in those first three months? Uh, first month was, was zero mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, like a lot of the guys do, I, I completely stopped pursuing, if that makes sense. Um, I, I uh, gave the space because I, I knew, you know, what, one thing that I don't, I don't think she mentioned um, prior to all of this, um, she very much had that common um, reaction to me hugging, like I would hug her, you know, downstairs during the day and, and it would come off to her as if it was about sex. Yeah. Just, and, and I, I didn't understand, but when, after I read the book and I understood why that was kind of taking place, I really stepped back and, you know, her being her, she was still, you know, she's not privy to the idea that I'm doing all of these changes. So she is still thinking of me the way I was two weeks prior. The creepiness, yeah. Yeah. The creepiness, the smothering, the trying to do more when I needed to do less. So the whole first month was almost the two of us sitting on either sides (laughs) of the house, you know, metaphorically, really. Yeah, yeah. Emotionally. She's still reeling from... Austin 2.0, the, the creep. And you right. can't you can't just mentally in your head saying, hey, not a creep anymore. No, you've got to earn those stripes, you know, use the military metaphor. And so, Shannon, did you in fact notice the creepy factor been dialed way back? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it went from, you know, me questioning, okay, he's rubbing my back or offering to rub my back or rub my feet or getting like too butt grabby in front of our son downstairs while hugging me. And I'm, you know, I'm in mommy mode. Like I, I'm not in the mood or mode to take care of my husband too. Like, I'm like, Oh my God, what do you need? Like what, Mm -hmm. why is this hug about sex now? Why? can't you just rub my feet? Why can't you just Mm -hmm. like touch my back? Like why, why, you know, and not to say in the same breath that I don't want our son to see us love each other, but there is a difference of Mm -hmm. appropriately loving your spouse in front of your children and not letting them see stuff that's just for you and your spouse, like alone time, you know, like when you two can be like goofy or like be kids, however you want to act, you know, like there needs to be some things that just the two of you do together. And you just illustrated perfectly. The, a big contention of the book is that there's parenthood and then there's eroticism, if you want to call it that. And they're completely two different worlds. And parenthood is the antithesis of eroticism of that sexuality. And when the mother is in mom mode, it's like she's wearing a heavy blanket of parenthood, of motherhood, of all the stress and everything involved in that. You can't just be Mr. Go up and grab your wife's boob in the kitchen, you know, while she's swiffering the floor or something. It's just, wow. It's like the ultimate. And does this guy lack any kind of social awareness? <laughs> yeah. Like, are you just dense? Like, are, yes. are you like... <laughs> so are you just some slobbering, desperate animal that you don't recognize what anyone with a brain would recognize? Like now is not the time for this. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so for that to go away, well, that, that in itself has got to earn them a lot of points in terms oh, of attraction. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. I, I don't think that men really understand, like, I don't know how clearly or how loudly I can say this. Most men do not understand how creepy and how inappropriate it is for them to come down stairs if they work from home or immediately walk in the door. And then they start just like almost just like panting and breathing down their wife's neck. Like that is gross. Like while she's cooking dinner for the kids, like I, come on, like, you know, chill a little bit. Like, let's talk about our day together. Let's 
how about you pay attention to the kids for a minute and focus on them. And then if you want to be that way, just the two of us and, you know, our relationship is healthy enough for that, then Mm -hmm. let's save that for later. You know, like we need to be a family unit and, and show a different kind of love at this moment. Mm -hmm. Know when it's right to open up those doors and, you know, the social intelligence, if you want to call it that, the social wherewithal to when to be sexy and when not to be and set the tone, set the mood uh, ahead of time. Um, and what Austin was doing as far as working on himself is a version of setting the tone and setting the mood, dial the creepy back down to zero, dial the ambitious go getter Austin 1.0 back up again. And then that's the beginning ingredients of setting the tone, knowing when to say when all that good stuff. And so Mm -hmm. this begs the question, Austin, at what point were you able to say, Hey wife, let me bring you in the fold a little bit and show you where all these changes came from. Let me talk about this group and this book and yada, yada. Cause that's, that's relatively unusual. Uh, that was probably early May when I realized that we were in a place we were, we were not anywhere near where we are now, but we were in a place then, um, about three months into it, early May, that my, at least my changes were set. So it wasn't a situation where I had done a, a few weeks of changes or a month or two of changes, and it would almost be affirmation seeking or approval seeking, or um, you know, I might still be flimsy. I was pretty much set in my new um, approach to our relationship and my personality uh, at that point. And then that's when I kind of started being a little bit more obvious in front of her, not trying to get her to see, but I was not hiding the fact that I was messaging guys in the group. And um, as, as you and a lot of the guys listening know, that can often take hours of your day, <laughs> you yeah. know, being on the, on the group or, you know, direct messaging guys. So, you know, she definitely asked me one day, you know, who are you messaging so much? No, I, why are you finger fucking your phone so much? Yeah. Why am I finger fucking my phone so much? One of my favorite terms. I like that. The group, the group introduced that term to me. I never heard that one before. That's, that's a good one. I I think she actually got that from me because I was saying it from from the group. (laughs) No, I said that to you because my dad says that to my mom. Oh, well, perfect. Oh, nice. Actually, you got it from me and then you spread it into the group. Yeah, Austin, you took it from the wife and you're the one who injected that into the group. So. Well, nice. I'm not Shannon. Take, so I'm we're not all speak- take the official ownership of that one. This is Shannon. <laughs> this is Shannon speak that we're all doing on the group. Yeah. This is awesome. That's okay. perfect. <laughs> you don't know how funny this is to me. <laughs> so you you hey, you weren't hiding it in any way. Yeah, I'm I'm on a group for guys. Yeah. And and then is the question like group, what what group? What are we talking about? What do you guys talk about in the group? Well, I think the first time she ever asked me. I just said, it's, it's a men's group. And she was more concerned with, well, why, why were you hiding this from me? And I was oh. like, I wasn't. I just wasn't actively yeah. telling you about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, and I think at that point, the, co- the conversation was over just from that conversation. And it just kind of came up again a week later and so on. I think one time she actually asked me, I just kind of straight up told her what it was. And, you know, from, from then on, you know, conversation started coming up about the group mm-hmm. and, it, and she just slowly learned more and more and more about it. And, and overall, Shannon, I would assume you think it's a positive thing. Yeah, I, I really, I do. Um, you know, when, when Austin told me that he was in a men's group, I was like, okay, that's cool, babe. I'm glad you have found something that you enjoy. That's awesome. And then we went on about our evening, continued dinner, drinking wine, and maybe watched one of our shows or something like that. And I was like, okay, cool, whatever. And then, um, you know, of course, the the finger effing of the phone continued. And I was like, oh my God. Okay, seriously, can we eat dinner? Like, I'm trying <laughs> to talk to you. Like, yeah. why is your nose buried and your phone again, like around this time of the evening. And I was like, this is just getting annoying. And, 
You know, I think it is a positive thing for guys that have, we'll say, like completed this three month long like boot camp in the first of it. And then I, I think and this is my personal opinion. I'm obviously not like a therapist or a psychologist or psychiatrist, but I think if the hiding of the group continues and there's not a healthy um, doorway that has been opened after the changes have been successful and, and it's kept private and the wife continues to see the man, the husband on his phone, like on <laughs> Facebook messenger. Mm -hmm. I think that's more detrimental. I think that takes you back about 10 or 15 steps because She's like, I fucking knew it. You know, he's on his phone all the time. He's gotten in shape. He's eating better. He's oh. active. No, it's is, not. It's not good. Is that because all of a sudden, all of those changes don't necessarily necessarily look like natural changes brought up by a guy doing this on his own, but rather it's a guy taking orders from someone, and he's hiding these little things from me. What is it that's so upsetting? Um, no, it's not. And, and I'm, see, I'm, I'm talking in like a uh, outside third party perspective sure. of other females, you know, like yeah. once I figured it out, I was like, oh, okay. Like I get it. You know, like this, like, you know, it, um, the men's group, you know, it's a way like a, you know, a, a way of support for for other men, you know, like if they're wanting to work on themselves, like whether that be like diet exercise or, you know, it's, it, it is not abnormal for men to need emotional support and want to talk to other men because there are just some things that I don't get, you know, like, and mm -hmm. that's fine. But what I'm saying is like, you know, if there are guys that have successfully done the first three, four months, of changes and then they are still on their phone a lot and they still haven't at least explained in whatever way is comfortable to their wives, what they are doing so much on their phone, those women that have a negative perception of those changes of like, okay, well, why is he going to the gym? Oh, he yeah. must have found somebody new. And then you're continuing this behavior of like the secretiveness and just being having your eyes and nose like glued to your phone screen, that's not doing you any favors. Mm -hmm. It just adds to the, the tension. Sneaky, it, it creates... creepy, sneaky, you're up to no good. Um, and also if you're hiding it from me, then it must mean you're ashamed of it for some reason. If you're ashamed of it for some reason, that means you're up to no good. Right. And also it, it continue If, if you are trying like your damnedest to, change a hostile relationship in your marriage do you really think that hiding this and being secretive and like acting like you're sneaking around on your phone like a 13 year old boy that's looking at porn <laughs> is going to do any favors for you mm -hmm. i don't think so now to play devil's advocate a bit a, a lot of the guys that do the hiding though for the majority of their marriage they've done a lot of things to try and reignite their bedroom and a lot of those, a lot of those things have been in the form of, "Hey, honey, look at me, look at me. Now, do you like me? Now, do you approve? Now, will you reward me with sex?" And over and over and over again, mm -hmm. just trying to win favor. So, by the man saying, "Hey, I'm reading this book to get better. I'm on this group to get better. Now, will you do?" They don't want to. They don't want to go in that direction. So they sometimes swing the pendulum too far over in the other direction, which is. No, I'm not on my phone. What are you talking about? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just chatting with my friend. I'm not on a group. What do you mean? And then sure enough, she yeah. sees the name of the group pop up on the phone and all hell breaks loose. So there's a middle ground there somewhere where it's read the book. You don't need to tell your wife about a book. You can read it. That's fine. She starts noticing changes. It's, I have no problem with saying, yeah, I actually, um, this is the book I read and it has a group that belongs with it. And it's a bunch of guys all getting together. And you know, the changes I've made over the last so many weeks or months, it's a lot of the stuff came from there. Oh, and okay. I completely a hundred percent agree with that approach. Not the other, the wet blanket approach we'll call that mm -hmm. of needing the wife's <laughs> approval because the man's viewing his wife as his mother and he needs 
approval for what? I don't know, but. Well, it's a, I have ads on Facebook. That's how I, that's my and Instagram. That's how I sell the book primarily. And people can leave comments on the ads. And I can't tell you how many men get on there and tag, you know, put their wife's name on there. So the wife mm. will see their comment saying, honey, should we buy this? Perfect. Honey, should I buy this? Honey, maybe you should read this and so forth. And sometimes the wives get on there and basically tell them to F off. And I can't believe you tagged me on this for the whole world to see. <laughs> Thanks so much. Or yeah, you go ahead and buy it and see where that gets you or something to that effect. It just never quite works. And in these guys' mind, they're in such a pitiful state. They're thinking like, this will be it. She'll see how how desperate I am and how I want to work on us. And she will instantly turn herself around and just be like, yes, let's work on us. And the bedroom will come back and it never works, obviously. So um, here you are. He's done all this work on himself. He's a new him. Um, Shannon, in your mind, is he just night and day a completely different human being now? Yes. Awesome. And I assume in a very good way. Oh, here's a, I hadn't thought about this. Is there any, do you miss any of the old him, Austin 2.0 at all? No, not really, no. <laughs> good. I could see where some people may say he was a little bit sweeter, maybe more emotional, more close in, in some ways, because a lot of guys, you know, turn on the sweetness just a little bit too much. They, they're, they're not that aloof, um, manly figure anymore. They're, they become like another girlfriend to the wife. Oh, well, yeah. Then you're talking of going into like, beta male territory and being one of the girls. <laughs> sure. Sure. It, it, some women may say, you know, I kind of miss some of that. Not all the way, but a little bit of that is okay. But so good. Is there something that stands above anything else on the, on the list of improvements that he's made? Is the, the one you can point to that says that that is a huge turning point in man that uh, above all the things, that's what really gets me going in the right direction. Um, I would say that the the changes that he actively made from reading the book and re-motivating himself, like reigniting his own fire within himself, really brought back um, like his uh, the appeal of his leadershipness mm. skills that mm -hmm. uh, attracted me to him in the first place, and you know and for a while I felt like I was wearing all the hats in the house, you know, when he was traveling so much with work, like obviously pre COVID, um, I, I felt like I was just doing it all. And, you know, when I said that to him, he would look at me so perplexed of like, what do you mean? Like, I, I just got home from being gone for four days. And what do you mean you're doing it all? Mm -hmm. And it's just because of the lack of, leadership diminished within our home, of course, uh, obviously. Um, and that sense of security, you know, like that alpha male appearance, personality type, you know, whatever you want, that je ne sais quoi, <laughs> that mm -hmm. alpha male like appearance just had diminished. And you, and you like this new, the fact that he's turned that knob up quite a bit. Right. And, oh, yeah. And so Bill begs the question then, have you noticed have you noticed him faltering in any way over the last 11 months? Have you seen little glimpses of the old him? No. Well, that's pretty good. Usually people can say, yeah, we had a fight and he broke down and something, something happened, but we, we recovered and back to normal or the new normal that is. So good, good. This is great. Here's the tough question though. And this is one that's not meant in any kind of confrontational way, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, as they say, it takes two to tango. Right. And so far, we've kind of painted this as the male side of the equation really dropped the ball. And as a result, X, Y, Z happened. And now he's made some changes and voila, here we are back to the way things used to be, at least as, as close as we can when you're, you know, two jobs, bills, kid, all that fun stuff. Um, what have you done, Shannon, or have you made any personal changes over the past 11 months? Have you been kind of mirroring some of his changes in any way? Has this reignited in you a new joie de vivre? I would say so, yes. Um, I, it's easier for me to, I, I mean, you know, obviously like I know that something that I was doing regarding like our intimacy levels, that had to change too because 
you know, when Austin said that, you know, he stopped pursuing me, I was like, well, alrighty, what's going on? Like, what, what am I doing wrong? Mm. Am I doing anything wrong? Do I need to realize that I have a husband too and a child and I need to figure out how to do both? Like I, you know, I, I also have to have save enough of myself mentally and emotionally for, for Austin at the end of the day. You should talk about that month and a half where I didn't initiate anything. And that's you... what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. I, in my head, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. um, and so, so that was a big, uh Oh, moment for you. Like this is, this is completely new. This is different. He went from creepy trying to negotiate to suddenly nothing. And so that instilled in you little thoughts of little guilt, maybe like, Oh, has he given up on us completely? If so, that's not good. Yes. Right. And I mean, it, it makes you, it should, it should make you question these things. If you are of, um, the, the mindset and the heart set of a wife to your husband, like, am I, am I doing something wrong? Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I never do anything wrong because it's surely always all his fault. <laughs> which which so, is a, I mean, a sentiment a lot of women have, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. Um, but you should, if you have a healthy heart and mind for your marriage, you should absolutely be questioning what's going on if your husband stops pursuing, you know, sex and intimacy with you. Mm -hmm. But you should be able to look at yourself and stand yourself the way that you are for 10 seconds in the mirror. And if you can't, then you need to look at what's wrong with you too. So here's an interesting question. Interesting thought. Was there ever in your mind, a point of no return. Could this, this, uh, what do you want to call it? Atmosphere of no intimacy of this domesticity first parenthood of a husband. Who's just kind of blah and lost his umph and everything else. Can that reach a tipping point where no matter what the hell he does, there's no coming back. This is the new us take it or leave it. No. Um, I mean, I, it's because I know without a shadow of a doubt that I 100% truly do love my husband. I love Austin. So there, there's not a tipping point for me of no, like a, a point of no return. Mm -hmm. it, this is a, um, it's a tough one because Austin will tell you, we know of guys who have had zero sex with their wife for years. I think right. the, I think the world record I've heard is eight years so far. Wow. I've heard a guy said nothing for eight years. And if that, if that guy tells me, you know, I'm, I'm trying this, I'm trying that, I'm getting nothing from my wife. And I say, well, how long has it been? Eight years? I just say, dude, <laughs> um, you know, come on. And I, I think the wife, if you were to sit her down, would say, oh, I, I broke up with this guy seven years ago. Um, she might say that, yeah. Or, hey, it's just not important to me anymore. That's just the way it is. That's the way I am. That's the way I'm wired. And I thought he I got hear. the point. I thought he got the point by now. <laughs> And I hear a lot of women say that in literally all different kinds of age ranges. Like you would not believe. Oh, I've heard it, it from my wife as well. Yeah. I mean, not I mean, my wife directly talking about her friends, what they can, what she comes back from meetings with some women, a lot of moms and um, a lot of them have just completely checked out of that side of themselves. Mm -hmm. like because the, and they, because like, of work, because of kids life, yeah. I'm too tired. I'm too this. I'm too insert thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a, um, in Austin, I don't know if you remember seeing this. I haven't seen it for a while, but people used to post on the group. I saw them several times. There was a, uh, two women who became somewhat famous on Facebook, YouTube, and so oh, forth. Those women. And I don't know their names. I don't either. But yeah, yeah their whole, sh their whole shtick is basically we're women. We're awesome. But at the same time, it sucks being women and man are stupid men and their need for sex how awful that we have to put up with this. Good thing we don't have to do that because we're not like that anymore. That's that's the whole shtick and super popular, millions and millions of views. And they, they, have, they go on tours and give talks on stage and stuff. And I, wow, I, I can't relate to that world. I don't get it. Um, but that's out there for sure. I'm, I've heard my wife come back from meetings saying, um, 
some of her girlfriends, all professional types, uh, say oral sex. I haven't done that for years. and I never will. I can't, I can't imagine doing something like that. You know, just something intimate like that is just asinine to them. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's for dirty movies. That's not for the real life. And she leaves that just saying, wow, there are really people like this out there. And part of me though says, and a lot of these women can attest to this until they meet the one that really kind of pushes their buttons, the guy that they really click with and connect with. And then that's when they say, oh, that's what all that erotic lovey dovey stars in the sky, butterflies. I can't get enough of him feeling is I, I haven't felt that before. And I, mm-hmm. unfortunately, I think there's a lot of marriages where they settle and they never had that to begin with. Without being too specific in case, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, like, uh, I hear from women that I know will say, I cannot believe you let your husband or you watch those shows with your husband, like Game of Thrones or True Blood, when there's just Tons, oh, wow. of nudity, tons of nudity, you know, tons of sex scenes. Wow. I mean, and I'm like, why? And the common response is I would never let my husband watch that show. Not even with me. Like that's inappropriate. Oof. And, and I'm like, or the, the woman says it makes me uncomfortable to watch <laughs> sex scenes with another female and male on the screen because I love my husband so much. I'm like, bullshit. You just don't want your husband watching yeah. another set of boobs on the TV, I, whatever the issue may be, but that is not, it's not healthy. I don't know. It's not healthy whatsoever. And it's a cultural thing. It's a very puritanical ultra conservative thing, but at the same time, it's also, you're right. It's just a, um, yeah, I've had uh, some, some heard some people say the woman says, because you'll get the wrong idea, man. If you see that, you'll you'll expect that what you're seeing on the screen. You'll expect that out of me, and that's not our world. I don't want you to get any ideas. That's one one thing that I've heard some some wives say. So it's horrible. It's terrible. I I have heard that, um, but I'm like, well, what is what is so uncomfortable about watching that on a TV show? Like nine times out of ten, like they're not actually having sex with each other. Like. They are actors. You do realize that, right? Like, (laughs) it's just a thought. Yeah. You know, not unless you are so uncomfortable with your own sex life, you're actually masking your own uh, fears or uncomfortableness and saying that you're uncomfortable having sex with your husband. I I don't know what it is, but it is bizarre. It's freaky. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think in this is, it's a good thing not to have, but I, I don't think you appreciate from your perspective, just how platonic some of these relationships can get. It's how, how platonic some of them start out and they never go into any kind of erotic, intimate sexual level ever. It's just a, it's just a relationship out of convenience, out of um, comfort, stability, and if a lot of these women will just, or, or it's morphed into that. And a lot of these women will tell you that, if we did have that spark before man, it is long gone and I'm completely okay with that. Mm-hmm. It's just, that's the frame of the relationship in their mind. And some of these women are completely flabbergasted when the man has to sit down with them and says, I don't think I can do this anymore. And she's like, do what? What are you talking about? Is, is it that important to you? I thought, you know, every couple of months was enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like, no. So it's just a totally different world, totally different world. And, um, but uh, I think my wife would uh, agree 100% with your, your sentiment. I can't, uh, she can't relate to that, that mindset, that non-sexual mindset. It's baffling. But uh, Right, then you would never watch anything but the freaking news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. Well, for a lot of these men, if at any time they approach an, anything, even remotely sexual, uh, the woman shames him immediately and shuts him up and said, that's not, you are not to go down that road. You're, you're a husband and you're a father to kids. How dare you perv anything that's any remotely sexual. So it's pretty sad, pretty sad. So, well, guys, I'm hoping that this uh, recording worked fine in the middle of this. If I'm, if it did work, I'm going to splice these together and hope it sounds good. But in the middle of this, I had a computer breakdown for the listeners. So I'm hoping that this works and it 
turns out okay. And thank you guys for being patient with me on that. But this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was really fun. Any, um, any final thoughts, any words of wisdom from either of you? How about, awesome. adv- how about a final advice for the men out there that used to be Austin 2.0? Don't, do not negotiate for sex. Do not have covert contracts about stuff. That's weird. Don't, please don't pant around the house doing chores and say, did, hey, did, did, did you notice there are no dishes in the sink? <gasps> wow. Like, okay, well, good fucking job. You did the dishes. Like, thanks. They need to get done anyway. Like, stop. Like, just do them. Like, it. that is just mind-boggling to me. Like, if we all worked, like, if, when I say we all, I mean, like, a household, meaning husband and wife. If you work together and get things done and that everything else will come together, like, your intimacy, your your wife noticing like, huh, wow, he knows how to use a vacuum cleaner and he did it on the floors and I didn't even have to ask him. That's impressive. Like he didn't even ask for praise. He didn't even make sure that I noticed that he did that. I think it's one important component, but we don't want to tell guys out there that, Hey, if you start cleaning the house, your, inst- your wife's going to jump your bones oh. instantly. That that's, but no, it's an, yeah, no. but it's an important no. part. And it's not necessarily just do chores dummy. It's be an adult dummy. It's, mm-hmm. it's stop acting like a child where you just, oh, wow, everything, just all the chores got magically done, you know, like a typical teen boy would do at home. He doesn't jump up and say, mom, let me help with things or anything. They just magically think the laundry gets done on its own. Right. <clears throat> it's like, no, if you don't just walk by the bed, make the damn bed. Right. And it's, um, and Austin can testify that the military kind of hammers that into you. How interesting, the most manly of manly endeavors going into the military. And what do they say? First thing you do is make your damn bed. Mm-hmm. and keep your uniform tidy and keep your footlocker tidy. And my dad was military, career military. So I know that world and I've kind of instilled it in myself and my behaviors and stuff. And I would always just kind of go Ugh, and get disgusted by guys that I saw that would be basically like, I have a penis, therefore I don't do that kind of stuff. It's like, what? I don't, I don't get it. And um, right. basically it's act like an independent human being that if something happened between you and your wife and you suddenly became single, you're not going to starve to death and you're not going to be living in squalor and everything else. You're actually going to be able to take care of yourself and be an independent adult. That's, right. that's pretty right. attractive. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Go figure that that's an attractive quality to show that you're a, a self sustainable male that like I could cohabitate with and marry and have a child with. Wow. Wow. How interesting. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So, and if, I think one thing yeah. that's really important what she's saying is because a, a lot of guys hear that that chapter where it, it's you know quit trying to do things around the house and expecting praise or really the, the you're, worst. You're being my thought interpreter. So he he knows what I'm thinking. Is this is this a form of mansplaining? Yeah, <laughs> of course it is, but. But it's, you know, a lot of guys take that chapter as to mean stop doing things around the house entirely. And I know you don't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. And you specifically say in the book, do things because they need to get done. But a lot of a lot of guys take it too far the other direction. They're like, well, I need to not be doing things for sex and, and not trying to do stuff around the house when really if they take it too far the other way and they don't do anything, now they're just lazy on the couch. Like it, it really yeah. needs to yeah. be, you know, being a man, stepping up, taking responsibility in the, being house. the, leader of the house. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Because it's sad in that um, sex is such a primal drive for men that a lot of guys that are desperate for it, all of their behaviors, even the most mundane innocuous stuff like changing the cat box and the dishes and stuff starts becoming about sex. And, Mm -hmm. and the guy will be like, I did this, I did the laundry, I did the blah, blah, blah. And the sex hasn't improved. I'm like, well, how do the the two don't compute? They they don't, they don't connect directly. You mean you just started acting normal and started doing stuff around the house and gosh, darn it. Where's my sex. You got to get that out of your mind. It's not helping in any way, shape or form. Absolutely. hundred percent. I mean, Wow, you married a person, you bought a house together, you started a life together. 
um, okay, well, who does the woman take care of <laughs> everything and said life? Like, mm-hmm. do you just only go to work and then come and sit on the couch and wait for everything to magically be done or appear in your lap? Like, that's not how that works. Well, there's a, there's an old, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? There's, there's no way of doing things, a culture around marriage, specifically in the West. We can think right. of, you can think of the 1950s America, right? The man comes the, home the with his, yeah. he's got his briefcase and his hat and he takes his, the wife's got a drink waiting for him and da, 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 da. And for some reason that has really entered into the psyche of a lot of men, even where it's laughably way off the mark, such as my wife makes more than me, works 80 hours a week. I work part-time doing some blue collar job, et cetera, et cetera. It's still in a lot of men's minds, I don't wash dishes. I don't make the bed. I don't do that crap. Help out kids with their homework. No, I don't, it's, that's not for me kind of thing. So it's so funny to hear that come from men. And, you know, you just want to smack them upside the head and say, well, who the hell are you? Well, I don't get it. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, this doesn't make any sense, but that's just so ingrained in our, in our way of being. And, and a lot of guys hearing me say this will think that that's almost like a feminist talk. And no, it's not. It's an adult no. talk. It's, it's a um, it's called being, yeah. you know, the leader of your house and exactly. It's a leadership quality to get shit done around mm-hmm. the house is a leadership quality, and it's not necessarily just housework either. It's just getting everything done. And right. and you women, if we allow you to, you will try to take on everything. No, but, I know. And Austin's you, mom is one of those. <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to take it from go. No, no, I got this. Mm-hmm. You have 19 other things on your plate. Concentrate on those. I'll take these three things. Uh, so other- I, I have to interrupt you before I yeah. forget this. Um, so Austin and I were just talking about this recently. I We often discuss things and agree on them. We're like, yeah, I, yeah, mm-hmm, 100% agree with you on that. And this happens to tie into what you're talking about of um, – the, the whole 19 things thing, like a woman trying to do that and be super woman and be, have, you know, super mom cape on. No, give it up, girlfriend. Stop. <laughs> do five things, but do all five of those things well. Do them extraordinarily well. Let your husband have the other five things and let him do those five things, mm-hmm. like knock them out of the park. That is what a functioning uh, split duties household is. You know, like, okay, well, right now I'm cooking. So you've got our son. You are 100% focused on him. And I'm 100% focused on making this meal for us the best meal that it can possibly be. Like, I'm not trying to cook, watch our son, fold some clothes and type an email or respond to a text to your mom and I end up sending it to someone else and then saying something you shouldn't, (laughs) you know, there's a difference. A a lot of women suffer from anxiety and (laughs) sometimes, and and sometimes that gets to an extreme point and can develop into full blown clinical depression Mm -hmm. and a a coping mechanism for a lot of women is control. If Mm -hmm. I can control it and take over these tasks then I don't have to worry about them because I know they'll get done and I know they'll get done right. And shoot, just one less thing to worry about, one less thing to be anxious about. But ironically, in turn, taking in all those things, those 19 things just makes them more anxious because it's impossible. You're a human being. You cannot handle 19 things at once and do them all well. You're going to fail at at least nine of those things. And, and And as women, you internalize those failures and say, I'm a failure because I dropped the ball of this. When in turn... <clears throat> just let the leash go a little bit. Let the man take on those nine other things that you're going to fail at. And just, yes, he will fail at two or three of them. And that's fine. <laughs> it's but okay. He, but let it hey, go. Failures are learning, learning opportunities, you know? Yes. And a lot of women are just so anxious that they no, I can't let my husband do fill in the blank because he'll fail at it. And that'll just make mm-hmm. me more anxious and more and lose more respect for him and get more angry and so forth and so forth. So the man throws his hands up to fine, you just take care of everything. But no, then that, she's creating this monster of yes. her own demise in her husband. She is the one turning him into this weird 
Schmeagle sex creature. Schmeagle sex creature. I love it. Like, I love it. <laughs> it's typically the woman's fault. Like, no, you can't do the laundry because you'll fuck it up and you'll do the colors wrong and mm-hmm. wrinkles. You'll, you don't know what kid A likes and what kid B is asking for when he says some weird made up word of what milk is or what dinner is, you know, like yeah. only I can do that because I'm home with them all the time and I know how to interpret them. <laughs> Which is just going towards the theme of infantilizing the husband. Mm-hmm. He's, he's not an adult anymore. It's just one of those kids and you just smack him on the hand and say, don't touch that. You, you don't know what you're doing. Go sit down <laughs> and, and then get upset when he's sitting down and doing nothing. And, I, oh my uh, yeah. gosh, that drives me up the wall when Vicious the wife cycle. says, are you just going to sit there? <laughs> yeah, that's what you just told me to freaking do. I'm doing it. Why am I still in trouble? Uh, relationships are fun. Mm-hmm. They can be if they're done right. And a lot of times it's just this open communication like what we're talking about here. And uh, end on this final note. Um, yes, communication is very, very important. And it's something that's thrown around a lot by a lot of people. Just communicate and everything will be fine. Yes, but what we're doing now is good communication. It's big, open, talk about it. I don't care whose feelings I hurt. We're all just saying what's on our, on our mind, getting it out in the open. And voila, better relationship as, as a result. Bad communication is what um, probably a version of what Austin 2.0 used to do. You know, the negotiating, the begging, the let's do this and this. Because in his mind, at that time, that was his form of communicating. Well, I mm-hmm. tried to communicate with her. I tried to tell her. I tried to negotiate and explain to her how having sex is important. And she's just not listening. Communication doesn't work. That form of it doesn't. Sure, that's that's called being a pitiful little guy begging for scraps from his wife. That's not communicating. Mm-hmm. So, very good. Well, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it a great deal. And I think the listeners will love this. I want to do more interviews with couples, but unfortunately it's pretty rare for the wife to be so involved, but rare in a, in a good, good way. It needs to be, needs to be more so more open communication about this kind of stuff. And I think we'll all be better off. So, all right, guys, thanks so much. You two have a good one. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.